My name's John Clegg, and I'm an earth scientist, uh, emeritus faculty at SFU in the Department of Earth Sciences. And my interests are pretty diverse, but uh, natural hazards, I say, would be the, the key set of uh, interests that I have. So this would uh, include earthquakes, tsunamis, landslides, and floods, and the risk they pose to people. Plate tectonics was a paradigm that uh, came on board around 1960, and it totally revolutionized uh, the field of geology. In fact, it had huge implications for other fields, such as biology. Um, and it really told us, or we learned, that the Earth is a, a very active uh, planet. Um, the outer shell of the Earth, think of the outer shell of an egg. We have an outer shell on this planet that we call the crust and the crust is fragmented. It's broken up into a series of very thin, relatively thin, but very large plates. Uh, and we call these uh, crustal plates. And they're moving. They typically move at the rate of, just uh, for comparison, the rate at which your fingernails grow. So it may not seem uh, very large, but these are very large fragments of the Earth's crust. And in many places where they're broken, they're kind of rubbing against one another, colliding against one another very slowly. An earthquake is the energy that's released when two uh, blocks of the Earth's crust slip suddenly. And that occurs along a fault or a fault line. So they're the sources of earthquakes. And typically, uh, the sources are at some depth within the crust. And from that point, the energy that's liberated by the slip of the block uh, radiates outward, kind of like you, put a, you drop a, a pebble in a pond and the waves radiate out from the, from the source. But the medium that uh, these, seismic, these waves are traveling in is, is solid material. It's not a pond. But uh, they, it does propagate, these waves propagate through the crust. And there are many different types of uh, seismic waves. Um, in seismology, we typically think of two important types, uh, so-called P waves and the S waves. P waves are super fast. They're the rabbits, you know, in the story. They move through the Earth's crust very fast, and they're the first waves that reach a populated area. Uh, and they are uh, waves that um, typically involve uh, um, kind of the forward and back motion of a of solid material. Uh, you think of people in a conga line, you know, it's kind of back and forth, back and forth. We call these primary waves. And they are fast, so they're the first ones that we feel or that seismic in instruments record. And they're followed uh, by slower secondary waves or S waves. These are uh, waves that travel more like a, a, like a snake. If you think of a, a snake moving across sand, it, it kind of has a sinuous, uh, form and imagine the crust doing that. It kind of distorts the crust not only in a forward manner but in a lateral manner as well, a snaky like motion. And these are the damaging waves. The S waves typically are much more damaging than the primary waves. They shear structures because they have this lateral component of movement and they're the ones that are responsible for much of the damage of an earthquake. Now, if you think about it, if you have these waves generated at the same time, at a point, as time, as they move away from the source, you get an increasing separation in time between the fast P waves and the slow S waves. And at long distances from the source of an earthquake, the difference in time of arrival of the P waves and the S waves can be as much as a minute. If we can somehow, which we can with seismic instruments, detect these P waves, then we can say, uh, that after a certain length of time, it's not much, but after a little bit of time, the really damaging S waves are gonna arrive. And now we're developing uh, networks of seismic instruments that are able to actually determine that separation of time at any given point. Very important in a big city, if you have 45 seconds or a minute uh, of advanced warning uh, before the S waves arrive, there are things you can do. It's not like you're totally lost, you can, uh, shut down gas lines. You can, in Japan, they shut down high-speed rail lines. They did that successfully after an earthquake in 2011. Um, there are many things you can do to uh, um, kind of alert people, um, to kind of tell them that, yeah, 
something bad's going to happen, but you can kind of get ready for it a little bit. We have uh, right here, right uh, just off our coast in Canada, uh, uh, two plates that are colliding with one another. Uh, we live here in Vancouver on what's referred to as the North American plate, and we live right at the edge of that plate. To the west, beneath the ocean floor, is another plate. It's a smaller plate. We call it the Juan de Fuca plate. And it's moving against the North America plate. It's trying to, it's colliding with the North American plate, but North America is more buoyant than this uh, oceanic plate. So the oceanic plate is going down beneath North America. And that's relevant because it's exerting forces that are responsible for the earthquakes that we have along the Pacific coast, uh, the earthquakes in the Pacific Northwest. And it's really responsible for the necklace of active volcanoes that lie just to the east of the coast. So you think of uh, volcanoes like Mount Baker just uh, in northern Washington state, uh, Mount Garibaldi in British Columbia. And then, of course, we have a chain that goes down Mount, um, uh, Mount St. Helens, which exploded in 1980, um, Mount Shasta in Northern California, a very long chain of these active volcanoes that are uh, active simply because the Juan de Fuca plate is diving down beneath the North American continent. We have had historic uh, indicators of earthquakes that go back about 150 years. Uh, in fact, our first seismometers were put in in the Pacific Northwest around 1900, maybe a little before 1900. And since then, we've been recording the earthquakes that occur in this region. And there have been many uh, moderate to large earthquakes in the Pacific Northwest, extending all the way up towards Haida Gwaii. Tsunamis are something that uh, indigenous people have known about for a long time. Um, people that came here from Europe had no appreciation for tsunamis. So when we had a historic tsunami from a big earthquake in Alaska, it was a Good Friday earthquake in 1964, magnitude nine plus earthquake, uh, source was so far from British Columbia we didn't feel any shaking, but it triggered a tsunami that caused damage uh, along the British Columbia coast and in fact uh, caused uh, fatalities as far south as California. And uh, the area that was most hit on our coast was uh, Port Alberni. The tsunami ran up uh, Alberni Inlet and surged into the low-lying areas of the community and fortunately did not kill anyone, but it did cause a lot of property damage. And this was a bit of a wake-up call, I think, for British Columbians that we actually can be impacted by tsunamis. Um, First Nations people have had a a more disastrous experience with tsunamis, and that before Europeans arrived on our coast, uh, in January of 1700, there was a gigantic earthquake, a magnitude nine earthquake right off our coast. It wasn't off Alaska, it was right off our coast. And within 20 minutes, the waves that were generated by that tsunami came ashore on Vancouver Island and uh, probably caused a lot of loss of life. Um, and in fact, First Nations people in British Columbia, as well as Washington, Oregon, Northern California, have oral traditions of that event. And you can imagine that that is something that you'd want to carry down from generation to generation. And they uh, didn't have written accounts, but they had these oral traditions that have survived to the present. And you can talk to elders in First Nations communities on the coast of British Columbia, and they'll be well aware of this earthquake and the tsunami that occurred in AD 1700.